I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and welcome to Scripture and Tradition, a program where we present sacred scripture through the lens of our tradition. And especially in these programs, talking about the role of scripture in our prayer life. Now, we'd love to have you be part of the show. You can do so during the live broadcast, which is Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, so adapt it to your own time. And you can call in on the live show. The phone number is 1-800-221-9460. However, that only works in North America. If you are outside North America, you can call country code 1, area code 205 271 2980. You can also send us questions via email by writing to scripture and tradition at ewtn.com or follow us and participate with the show on Facebook and YouTube. Now, I want to begin this show by remembering that today is the 80th anniversary of the Empire of Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor. That was December 7th, and it's called Remembrance Day. Uh, over 2,000 people died in the attack. And then, of course, that opened up the w declaration of war. Um, Japan had declared war without telling us, and uh, many people died in the Pacific theater of the war. And, of course, uh, Nazi Germany also declared war on us and we fought in Europe. And at the request of the Allies, we pushed first in Europe and then finished up in the Pacific. And it's a day to remember great bravery, but also great sacrifice and to remember the souls of those many people who died, not only on December 7th, but throughout the whole war. And I remember Sister Ida pointing out to us students when I was in eighth grade, back in, it would have been December of 1962, that the um, war began on December 7th here. But Japan is on the other side of the international date line. So it was already December 8th the Feast of the Immaculate Conception of Our Lady and the patroness of the Americas, the United States in particular. And then we, uh, it ended in Japan uh, on August 15th. It was the 14th here. It was the 15th there, the Feast of the Assumption. And there's something of Our Lady forming bookends from her conception to her assumption in the, the, the calendar of the church. And, you know, we need to keep close to our Blessed Mother and ask for her ongoing intercession for the United States, for us individual, uh, individually for sure, but also as a nation, because there are other dangers and moral risks that are part of the modern world. So we need her intercession. And we ought to remember that as we celebrate the uh, Holy Day of Obligation tomorrow of the Feast of the Immaculate Conception of our Blessed Mother. So keep that very much in mind. Now today, we're going to talk about how God chooses to listen to us on a very intimate level. Very profound intimacy because as we talked last week, Christ joins us in human suffering. That's one of the reasons he became flesh, to meet us at the level of our pain. Now, we're going through a book I wrote called How to Listen When God is Speaking, a guide for modern day Catholics. You can still get it at EWTNRC.com where it is item number 1833. So, 
Let us now begin. We are still in chapter 7 of that book, uh, which is entitled, What Do I Expect from Prayer? Okay. Now, um, last week went, we went through some elements of our Lord's Passion and made various connections between aspects of His suffering and our suffering. And all of us and any of us can reflect on the individual events of Christ's Passion and Death. Take a look at them and make applications to our own experiences of pain and suffering. In my last book, I did that again, uh, but I did it in light of the sex abuse scandal, especially considering how those who were the victims of the abuse, whether the actual individual victim or their families, I reflected on how they are suffering with Christ, that the things that they went through in, in that horrible experience for them was akin to various elements of Christ's passion. And any one of us can do the same as we go through the pains, different kinds of pain that we have. When we enter into this kind of prayer, we ought to hear God and expect to hear God speaking to us in that suffering. The reason He can speak to us so profoundly is that He entered our suffering. You know, I have studied lots of pagan societies and ancient history, and you don't see the pagan gods suffering with human beings in order to console them. That, that's just not part of pagan religion. It's only when God becomes flesh that he enters into our experience of suffering. Even in something as profound as the book of Job, when Job finishes his requests to ask for an explanation of why I've gone through all this suffering when I was a good man. I didn't do anything wrong, and you have nothing against me. When Job goes through all that, he very much looks for an answer, and all that the Lord can say to him at that point is, the mystery of suffering is too deep for you to understand. It's when God the Son becomes flesh and enters into the experience of suffering like we do, that then we can begin to see His role in helping us. God chooses to hear our suffering and hear our pain on the very level of suffering. He joins us there and enters into that experience. And as he goes through the suffering on the cross, as he goes through the various kinds of torments, we see that he's able to resonate with the things that we go through. And that was the point of that meditation last week. We can have a sense of God having sympathy for us because He suffers with it. That's what sympathy means. Sym, in the beginning of a word, means with in Greek. It's actually the Greek word sin, S uh, sigma epsilon nu. And that means with in Greek, sin. And you can put it as a prefix of a word. Pathos is a Greek word meaning suffering. So sympathetic 
means to suffer with. And our Lord has that. And this becomes the meaning and purpose of his passion and death, at least one very important aspect of it, and we can begin to understand the purpose of our suffering. I very frequently remind people of something I learned from Pearl Buck. Um, she was a famous writer, the child, the, the daughter of some missionaries to China from the early part of the 20th century. And she went through a lot, and her family suffered a lot and such when they were in China. But Pearl Buck, you know, said that it was only in my 80s that I was able to see some of the purpose and meaning of my suffering. For a lot of us, when we're going through it, to demand, why are you letting this happen? What's going on? That, I think that's the wrong approach. You have to experience it and be with it and suffer in it. And then in retrospect, you can begin to get some clues as to what you went through. I don't think we do well to try and figure it out at that moment. I never do anyway. I never get much insight at the time of the suffering. I just don't. And I don't think I'm alone. I oftentimes have to experience it, go through it, and then understand. And, um, I even learned that one of the reasons that Pearl Buck's wisdom made so much sense to me is that I could see in the mid and later 60s and beyond that a lot of adults in the places where I lived were beginning to finally reflect and understand a bit of what the World War meant to them. Jewish people, I, I had a, a professor that was a rabbi, uh, and he said we couldn't even begin to reflect on the meaning of the uh, Holocaust, the, the, the Shoah, as they call it in Hebrew, the, uh, the suffering of the Jews in Nazi Germany. We couldn't begin to understand it until the late 60s. It was just such a shock. And we need to get through that shock. I also was privileged to meet the great uh, student uh, survivor of Auschwitz, Elie Wiesel. And he, uh, he used to come to Vanderbilt when I was a student and speak. And it was in that process and in those years of the eight, early 80s he began to say, now I begin to understand. And he had lost his faith, he had rejected faith in God. Why could God allow us to go through this? He was one of the uh, only survivors of his family, I think the only one. And so he went through so much, but he began to reflect on that. And in the 80s, he began to see it and he came back to a faith in God, and you could see that he recognized it was making him a better man to have worked through that. This is something all of us need to pay attention to. And, you know, one of the things is that we learn to cope with situations of pain, begin to understand it, and we begin to <coughs> <coughs> accept the bad things that have happened to us. And as we begin to accept it, we sometimes even move to a certain level of peace, interior peace, and at times an interior joy. Again, thinking of World War II, it was somebody like Corrie Ten Boom who found that as she helped people. She survived a, a, a German not concentration camp. She had been hiding Jews and got caught. And, and her whole family died in the camps, but she survived. And 
she came to realize Europe needed help. They needed Christ, and she would be there to help people. Uh, and she had flashes come back to her of great rage. She saw one of the guards that had, in, you know, taken her into the camp, and he had forced all the women to strip naked, and you know, and including her and her sister. And, you know, that they were dividing some off to go to the gas chambers, others to be prisoners and such. And she met him and she felt that rage come back. And yet she had to practice what she preached and forgave him. And went up and embraced him, not with great ease and just, oh, it's okay. No, she had to struggle through all those old resentments. They can come back and yet suffering with Christ. And when you read her book, The Hiding Place, you see how she kept going back to Christ's passion and saw what she was going through in light of that. For instance, when she and, her, and all the other women had been stripped, she remembered Christ being stripped of his garments. That came to her mind. And I think as she eventually did come to peace and joy and did a lot to reconcile Europeans to each other. She became a force for that reconciliation. You can see that she found this new level of meaning in the pain and that it gave her a motive to become a better person. That does not mean that the pain simply just goes away. It doesn't. The pain remains. Um, you know, in the case of what happened during the war with the concentration camps, not only by the Nazis, but also by the Empire of Japan and our allies, the Soviet Union, put many of their own soldiers into concentration camps at the end of the war because they were afraid. Now they knew how to use guns. They're afraid that they would rise up against the government. So they had many of them worked to death after they had won the war. That was how the communists showed gratitude to their own soldiers. They were afraid of them being armed and afraid of them knowing how to use weapons and how to fight. And they were so scared that they sent them off to Siberia to work in uh, slave labor camps until they died. And, you know, th that was just part of the situation. And so for many, many people, the pain just didn't go away. And even when somebody comes to a certain kind of reconciliation, because many of them did come to find Christ. They've been raised in communism, but they came to find Christ because there were lots of priests and nuns in those gulags. And they offered mass and prayed. And there were many Protestant groups also praying and finding Christ in those gulags, as well as in the concentration camps. And the pain didn't go away. It's just not disappearing. But they could find that as they suffered with Christ and Christ came to their level, they experienced another sense of meaning and purpose, peace. And again, some of them came to experiences of real joy, despite the pain still being there. We're going to take a break, we'll come back in a couple of minutes and continue on with this to talk about another aspect of how our suffering becomes part of our prayer, how we use it in our prayer. So let's come back and stay with us.
right. So we are talking about um, ways in which we not only pray through our pain, but we bring our pain and our difficulties and sufferings into our prayer. A very important part. Again, life is hard. And there are a lot of challenges that are given to us by our own foolishness and stupidities, as well as the, the, our sins and the sins and foolishness of other people as well. So we need to deal with this. And one of the things that we can do is uh, have a sense of learning to unite any suffering that we have with that of Christ, okay? And we do so by considering our pain in the light of Christ's passion. So we talked about that last week. We reflected on how there are important parallels between the suffering of Christ and our own suffering. But now I want to go to another level of uniting our suffering with him and to do so in prayer. So, um, we first of all have to realize we need to enter into an even deeper level of trust in God. We can trust that, as St. Paul says, God works all things for his, our good and for his good. He says that in Romans chapter 8. And as such, that this suffering um, is something that you know, brings out another level of trusting that God can use it for his purposes. And he can bring good out of the problems. And this is something that we see in Christ. He brings the salvation of the world out of his death on the cross. If God can work the suffering of his son into the salvation of the world, he can also bring good out of our suffering. We can never forget that. Now, we've already taken a look at some of the problems and the persecutions and suffering that were experienced by people like Jonah and Jeremiah, uh, the prophets, as well as Jesus. And it's important to remember all three, Jonah, G Jeremiah, and Jesus, had suffered precisely because they did the will of God. It wasn't because they disobeyed God. It was in obeying God that their problems came about. A lot of people use the phrase, no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> and that oftentimes happens inside the church, by the way. So you know, don't, don't go whining. Uh, others have suffered more than you have uh, at the hands of people in the church or in the case of Jonah and Jeremiah within Israel. And that, in fact, they suffered precisely because they were uh, uh, faithful to God. Uh, they, they suffered rejection for that very purpose. And we can see that while all three uh, suffered um, in, in this pain. In the case of Jesus, there is an even deeper level of the way that his suffering is woven into his ministry. Remember the great line in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, where our Lord said to the apostles after they were arguing, which, you know, that, that John and James are, are asking to be at the right and left hand. And, and man, those guys, you know, they're all upset. And Jesus says to them in Mark 10, 45, For the Son of Man also came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
This is his purpose. And he said this right after his third prediction of his upcoming passion and death. Three times our Lord predicted that he would suffer. And, uh, you know, in uh, uh, Mark uh, 8 and 9 and 10, and each time that he made that, the apostles tried to talk him out of it. Think of Mark 8, verse 32, when Peter took Jesus and rebuked him for saying that he was going to suffer and die. And Jesus then saw the disciples, looked at them, not at Peter, and rebuked Peter, said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not on the side of God but of men. And then the apostles, when they hear him second time predict the uh, passion and death in Mark 9, then they become silent. Well, they start arguing amongst themselves about which of them is the greatest. And they're just talking amongst themselves. And he has to ask, what are you talking about? And they, they were silent because they were trying to figure out which of them is the greatest. They, they're not focusing on Christ's suffering, but on how great I am, not how great thou art to God. And then in Mark 10, verse 37 to 40, is when James and John want to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. And Jesus has to tell them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I've been baptized? Oh, yeah, we can do that. Yeah, we're, we're able. He said, okay, well, the cup that I drink, you will drink, and the baptism with which I'm baptized, you'll be baptized. Referring to his suffering. That's what he's talking about. The cup is the cup of pain, and the baptism is the baptism of suffering. But to sit in my right hand or my left is not mine to grant. It's for those for whom it has been prepared. The Father's in charge of that. And so this is how they act when Christ predicts the, the passion. And, you know, our Lord knows that this is how they act. And he knows that he's going to suffer. And what does he do? He marches straight toward Jerusalem. He goes on that journey toward the time he knows that he is going to die. He doesn't, uh, you know, skip out on that. And this is a very important uh, element for him. Now, this meaning of the suffering of Christ and his death is very important to understand. Why would that be? God could save us some other way besides suffering. And some people even go to the point of saying, well, God the Father is pretty cruel because he sends his only son to die. That's not nice. What kind of a father does that? A father who knows that he can trust his son's love and a father who cares for all of us to be redeemed. That's what kind of father. And these wise guys who have a superficial understanding of these things miss out on it. Now, to understand the meaning of it, consider what had been said in Genesis when the Lord God creates the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he commanded the man, saying in Genesis 2, verse 16, you may eat freely of every tree of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Disobedi disobedience leads to death as a punishment. And even though they didn't die right away, it's delayed until they began their family and started the human race, you see that eventually they do die, and death comes to us all. And therefore, Christ takes on death and suffers death as a way to, you know, 
injustice take that punishment. But he does it as someone who is completely innocent. The rest of us die, but we're guilty of sins throughout life. And we're disordered. Just like Adam and Eve were, were guilty. So also we. But Christ is innocent, completely innocent, without sin of any kind. And he gives himself to die and take the punishment for every human being who is ever born or ever would be born. And it's important that it's God the Son who dies. It's one of the great insights of Saint Anselm, Cur Deus Homo, why did God become man? And it brings out how in his divinity, Christ is infinite. So there's no limit to the power of the redemption that he won. And there's no limit in time. He is God and therefore outside of time. But he's also truly human, like us in everything except sin, the scripture says. And this is a very important thing. And this means, this means something uh, very, very important that there is no sin you and I have committed or can commit that is stronger than the death of God the Son on the cross. There is no example of, uh, of that. You can't commit a sin stronger than the death of Christ. You can block yourself by lack of faith from having that forgiveness, but you are not going to sin in a way more powerful than the death of God the Son. Secondly, there is no time or point in history that is beyond the forgiveness of sin. No matter his Eternity means that he is always avail available to give us forgiveness anytime and anywhere we ask. This infinity is what we also celebrate along with the human suffering of Christ. And this is inherently linked to his mission. This is why he was born. This is why he died. And we are to constantly call ourselves back to that understanding. Okay? Let's stop there. We'll continue on from that point next week. Um, we have a caller on the line. Uh, Allison? Are you there? Hi there. Thank you. Sure. Where are you from? Well, I'm from Florida, and I went to the Holy Land with you in 97. Wow, that's some time ago. It sure is. I'm still looking at pictures of it. <laughs> um, Good for you. I feel bad asking you this question because I should know it after having been in the Holy Land. But mm -hmm. um, why is it that the Jewish people still do not believe the Messiah has come? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, there are many, many people who are Jewish, that do believe that Jesus is the Messiah, okay? A large group. Um, so th that's one thing I think to keep in mind, and then that the Lord is stirring with them. Just like there are also many, many, many millions of Muslims today who are coming to, un to accept Christ. Uh, that's going on all over the world. Uh, many of them experience Christ in their dreams, and they come to accept them. But we have a couple problems uh, in the Jewish community today. One, there is a very large majority, and you may remember this from Israel, where uh, Jewish people today are very frequently without faith in God at all. Many of them don't believe in God. Or... They, if they do have some glimmer of faith, it's in the background and they just don't practice. And that, that would be, the, uh, according to what I learned in my first visits to Israel, um, uh, this is um, uh, the majority, about the 80 percentile, both in Israel and in the United States. I think there's growing faith in God 
We should pray for them to grow in their faith in God. But that's, that's a second problem. Thirdly, and this is something all of us Christians have to take very much to heart. Christians have a long history of anti-Semitism, anti-Jewish uh, relations. There has been persecution of the Jews. Now, Jews have persecuted Christians in different places when they could. That happened, for instance, uh, in the Persian invasion of the Holy Land, uh, Jewish people were very much part of rounding up tens of thousands of Christians and executing them. That happened in uh, 613, 614. But much more often, Christians have rounded up Jews and persecuted them in many parts of Europe. What kind of example is it to show anybody that you disregard them, that you treat them badly, you isolate them from you and ghetto and persecute and try to kill them and sometimes try to force conversion. Those are terrible, sinful things. And none of them is acceptable. And, that's a, and that bad example still sticks in the craw of... It, it, brings many uh, Jewish people to feel riled up with anger and, and, a, and in righteous indignation at them being attacked that way. We have to keep a look at all those different factors. And our task is never to force anybody to convert. We present the reasons for conversion and God gives the grace of conversion. But we want to be available to uh, do what we can uh, to help people with that. So that's, that's very, very important. And, um, and make sure that right now there is an increase of anti-Semitic uh, behavior. Uh, synagogues and Jewish people and Jewish schools being attacked. Not by Christians because of Christianity. Mostly by people on our far left because of politics. We have to be able to stand up and protect them and stand up and make sure that we know something where that could be attacked. We have to reach out and do what we can to, you know, help in the healing process if they are attacked. Uh, that's unacceptable behavior. And we have to stand with the Jewish people at this time or anybody else who experiences that kind of persecution. Uh, and, of course, we have some of our own, but... To stand up for everybody. All right, they have another caller. Barbara, where are you calling from? Montgomery Village, Maryland. Wonderful. And what can we do for you? Well, I was just wondering why the Hebrew Bible, I believe pronounced Tanaka, was translated in Greek rather than Hebrew. And, it, and the reason is, for instance, yeah. the mother of the Messiah in Greek means a young woman, whereas the Hebrew word stipulates a virgin. So no, totally you actually different. the other way around. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, really? Yeah. yeah, the the in Isaiah 7 verse 14, the word that's used is alma. Alma. And um alma means a young woman presumably in, in that culture, presumably a virgin. And that's how the Jewish people understood Alma, because they translated the Bible, the Old Testament, the Tanakh, not Tanaka, just Tanakh, Tanakh. Uh, and that's, that's an acronym that stands for Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim, which be, means the law, the prophets, and the writings, okay? And they translated it into Greek around 250 B.C. And there they translate uh, Alma into Parthenon, meaning virgin. But also in the 2nd century B.C. 
And in the first century, uh, we don't know the exact time, the, that same text was translated from Hebrew into Aramaic. And in the Aramaic, they used the word Bathula. And Bathula also means specifically virgin, not young woman in general, but um, uh, virgin. So what does that indicate? That when Jewish people translated the Bible from Hebrew into Greek and then into Aramaic, they understood Alma in terms of being a virgin. And that's why they use the specific word meaning virgin in both languages when they translate it. Is that sort of what you're asking about? Yes, exactly. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah. There's, uh, there's some folks who try to say, well, you know, in Isaiah, it, it can mean an unmarried uh, woman, uh, you know, or young woman. Um, in their culture, you have to keep in mind how very, very important it was for a young woman to be a virgin until she married. Um, that was really a high priority and remains so in Middle Eastern society, uh, except in modern Israel, not so much. But in, among religious Jewish people and among Muslims and uh, Christians in the Middle East, that's extremely high priority. So it's just part of their assumption. And they understood Isaiah to be speaking about a virgin shall conceive uh, and bear a son. You know, it's not that big a deal when a young woman gets pregnant. Now, that happens to young married women all the time. But for a virgin to conceive and bear a son, that's different. That's unique. So that's why they made it very, very clear. And then in the New Testament, when they quote Isaiah 7, verse 14, the New Testament also uses the Greek word parthenon, meaning virgin. Okay? So very, very specific. All right. Let's take a break. We'll come back with more of your questions and comments. Please stay with us. Right. Welcome back. We, I'm going to take an email next. Uh, I've seen this a couple of weeks. I wanted to get to it. It's from Kathy, who says, Father Mitch, where does it say in the Bible that Mary ascended into heaven? Also, where does it tell about her coronation? Does this knowledge come from somewhere else? else other than the Bible. I'm a Catholic and truly believe these things, but part of my family is not. I'd love to explain these factors to them, but I don't know how. Well, Kathy, uh, what I would recommend is that you take a look at Revelation chapter 12, where St. John saw a woman clothed with the sun standing on the moon with a crown of 12 stars on her head. And then she gave birth to a, a son, a man child as it's called, uh, who would rule the nations with an iron rod. Now, by the way, that phrase that he ruled with an iron rod comes from Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is a messianic psalm. It's about the Messiah. And the son that she has gets taken up into heaven. And, you know, so it's, it's a real brief overview of the birth 
and then all the, the, quickly going through the life of Jesus to, to his ascension. But there's where you see the Blessed Virgin Mary crowned and glorified in heaven in that real quick view. And so that's where it is found in Scripture. Now, you may come across some people who try to say, well, that's a symbol of the church. <clears throat> Wrong answer. Because the church does not give birth to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. It's rather the church comes from the side of Christ. Christ is the new Adam. And his bride, the church, comes from his side, especially as it's pierced. The church doesn't give birth to Christ. He gives birth to the church. The church comes from him. The one woman who did give birth to him is not the church, but the Blessed Virgin Mary. And that's where we see her, you know, glorified and crowned with thorns. Now, the descriptions of her assumption come later. Uh, there, there are a few of them from different parts of the Eastern Church, uh, and they all describe how she died. The apostles weren't there. They came back before she died, uh, and they all say that they buried her, and then Christ raised her from her tomb. Those are not in Scripture. Those are from later. But um, this is something that, um, you know, is, is very much, uh, you know, part of the tradition and has become doctrine since. But the scriptural element is right there, okay, in Revelation chapter 12. All right, we have another caller. Hello, Jim. Jim, are you there? Oh, there you are. Yeah, I'm here. I'm sorry. That's okay. Where are you, where are you calling from? I'm calling from Florida. Wonderful. And um, what is your question? Uh, Father, in line with the suffering and all that that you were talking about earlier in the mm -hmm. show, uh, I take eight prescriptions a day. Mm -hmm. And I'm retired. I'm in my late 70s. I'm homebound. Mm -hmm. And I'm a cradle Catholic. I was taught against suicide right from as sure. long as I can remember. Sure. But I want to know if it's considered suicide if I were to consider just stopping all medication. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of it is internal, you know, heart and so forth that you can't see. Right. Some of it is for pain. Mm -hmm. But if I were to stop all medication and just leave it in God's hands, is that wrong? Um. No, I don't think it's wrong, but it's certainly not very wise. Here's why. <laughs> like you, I'm in my 70s, and I'm on a variety of heart meds and all that. And at this point, these are fairly easy to access. And God, in his providence, has made these things available to us. Now, I don't think there's a command that you have to take those meds. But, you know, when you do go to see our Lord, he might have some questions that, look, I have you at a time in history and a place in the world where, I, where you could receive these things, and I want you alive. Why did you neglect the things that I made available to you. And that you may have to deal with questions about responsibly using your medicine. And this is something that is uh, very, very important to, to keep in mind. Your own, you know, to, to stop using the medicine because, well, you know, I can experience more suffering. You don't it's not a good idea to try and choose which suffering you have. You have enough that you can't choose. For instance, the temptation to commit suicide. I'm sure there's some other suffering and pain that you're dealing with. Deal with those. 
and bring those into your prayer and offer th that suffering up in union with Christ. Take your medicine and be responsible with them and see what the Lord may have in store, even if you're homebound. You know, our sisters are up in Hansville. And they're, they stay in their home praying and interceding. There's a lot to intercede for. There's a lot. So you have plenty to do. And, you know, our older Jesuits, that's what they do is uh, they very much pray uh, for us. And we need them. And we need you to do that as well. Okay? All right. Do you have another caller? Morgan? Yes, Father. Where are you calling from? Marcellus, Illinois. All right. And what is your question? A fundamentalist minister, calls himself an evangelist, mm -hmm. likes to say that Jesus in his ministry never, uh, by his own power, did his miracles. It was only through the Holy Spirit that he, of his own powers, he didn't mm -hmm. cause the miracles. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. also See, fond of saying that the uh, Blessed Virgin was the mother of Jesus, not the mother of God. Yeah, right, 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 right. Uh, I suspect he may not have had a very profound theological background, I suspect, because if he did, he would know. Well, and, and you may want to ask, maybe he doesn't believe that Jesus is God. Does he? He does. Find, find out, Morgan, if you know this guy. Ask him, do you believe that Jesus is God the Son? Um, he may not, because there are a lot of denominations today that don't. Um, here would be a better way to state things. Whenever God acts towards creation, that's us, we're creatures, Whenever God acts toward any and all creatures, it is always, always, always all three persons acting in unity. That's why we call it the Blessed Trinity, not the tri, you know, the, 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 the tritheism, three gods. It's one God, that's the unity, and three persons. And all three persons always act together whenever they act towards creation. Only within their own relationships do you see the distinction. But towards us, they act in absolute unity. So uh, he may not know that much the, uh, Trinitarian theology yet. Maybe you can help turn him in that direction. All right, I've got to turn in another direction because we've run out of time. May the Lord bless you as you prepare to celebrate the great feast of the Immaculate Conception and guide you and fill you with his peace, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And remember, this network is brought to you by you. You make it possible with your gifts. So please remember to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill and we will be able to pay all of our bills too. Thank you, and God bless you. Mm -hmm.